Welcome to the Biltmore Church Podcast. Our church exists to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus who reach up, reach in, and reach out. And this podcast is a resource that's hopefully going to help you do just that. My name is Christian Cooper, and I get to serve on staff here at Biltmore Church. I'm here today with our lead pastor, Bruce Frank, also here with special guest Daniel Evans, who is our East Asheville campus pastor. And I'm really excited to talk to you both today about the kingdom of God and culture. We're in week seven. It's kind of hard to believe. We're in week seven of our teaching series called The Tale of Two Kingdoms. And we've been talking about being citizens of the kingdom of heaven while still living in the kingdom of the world. And so today we're going to talk about uh, culture, which is quite a loaded topic that we could spend a lot of time on. Um, But we're going to talk a little bit about where we're headed and then also what it means for followers of Jesus to head into a changing culture. Um, So just to jump right in uh, without any kind of intro or anything like that. Let's just let's just go for it. Um, to help set this up, I wanted to ask kind of a big question. Uh, why should we as followers of Jesus, why should we as believers even try to understand or look at or preach about or talk about the culture that we live in? Why not just ignore it or retreat from it? Well, because you... you disobey God. I mean, God puts you as a missionary. And so just like if you were to go to a foreign country, you would learn their culture, their language, their customs, so that you could better take the gospel into that culture. Uh, And you see this all over the book of Acts, whether it be Paul in Athens or wherever that is, you you go in there, you go in there as an ambassador, uh, as a missionary. And part of being a missionary is understanding the people you're, you're talking to. And so the big picture is wherever you are, whether you're in Asheville, North Carolina, or in Japan or Asia, you know, God's, if you're a Christ follower, God's called you to be mm-hmm. a missionary in that place where you are. And so for us here in America, it's a different time for us because for, you know, the better part of 160 years or so, uh, the culture was somewhat supportive, respectful, encouraging, if not not a Christian culture, but they were encouraging to the Christian ethic, if you will, mm-hmm. or at least not uh, a, a lot of them against it. And that is, you know, that has shifted and is shifting. And But it's a good reminder that's where Christianity was born. Christianity was born in a culture that was vehemently opposed to it, that mm-hmm. was tremendously pagan uh, with the whole Roman, uh, you know, having them under, under their thumb. So you know, the gospel will flourish, is, but our people have got to, you know, our people have got to understand it. Yeah, that's great stuff. Uh, You know, you you mentioned there a lot of things I'd love to talk about today. Um, One of those is that we are seeing. You've said it's we've kind of existed in this historical anomaly with culture, where you're saying it's it's actually been relatively supportive. Um, But we're we're also saying things are beginning to change in the West, especially. We're starting to see some of those shifts. So, um, for either one of you guys, what do you think are some of the challenges of the cultural moment that we find ourselves in now, particularly for followers of Jesus? Yeah, let me say something, and I uh, want uh, John Wick over there to also talk <laughs> talk into it. That is, so that's my cultural, cultural exegesis right there. <laughs> there um, you know, I, that was really the genesis of the message, because the mm-hmm. message, I, to me, you go against, you. it's easy as a Christian to almost live in, the, to get caught up in the outrage uh, of, of the, as you see a culture changing, it's almost, it's very easy to start to look at the culture, because the culture is a widely held set of beliefs and values, but those are values and beliefs held by people. Mm-hmm. And so oftentimes Christians get outraged and we confuse, we get mad. It's very hard to distinguish that we're not angry at the people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and that's where we tried to look at the Luke 7 passage about the distinction, the way the religious leaders looked at the, at the lady and the way that Jesus looked at it. And it was not, he did not condone, he did not back off any of that, but he also, uh, he, he showed great compassion on the lady. And to me, that was the tension. It was helpful for me to go back because it is easy. You listen to talk radio or you listen to, you know, all this outrage. Politicians raise money to make you mad. Uh, news programs, 24-hour news cycle, all that stuff. It is designed. We're very tribal now. In other words, if you don't believe just like me, then I'm against you. You know, you have a lot of more monologue than dialogue in mm-hmm. the past. So all that being said, we are constantly being stirred up. And the Christians... There's no way you can just extricate yourself from it. So the question is, I got to put a lens on that is different than someone else. I've got to put the lens on if I'm a follower of Christ. I got to put the lens on how did he see his culture represented in that case by the woman. And then I've got to drive myself. I've got to try to put that same lens on on a daily basis to have both, you know, I'm, um, I'm going to hold to my convictions, but I'm going to do so with a, with a broken heart of compassion. Yeah. 
Yeah, Pastor set it up so well. I I, I think there's two poles that, that we could go to. We, we could either, either go to syncretism, where mm-hmm. we just look exactly like the, the culture around us, or we could be separatist and just totally remove ourselves. And so I think right, rightly exegeting the culture, but then trying to find that middle ground. And I think healthily, uh, it, it, it requires wisdom, but healthily, we're, we're kind of bouncing back and forth and finding that smooth spot in between the two poles where, where we don't look exactly like the culture, but we're in it enough where we understand the folks that we're around yeah. and, and we understand that the gospel isn't a felt needs gospel that, that just gives people what they want, but the gospel does have answers to the desires and the needs and the longings of the hearts around us. And we have to know what those are so that we can then speak the gospel into it and see it be effective as the spirit moves. Mm-hmm. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I'm hearing you say even there that in the midst of an ever changing culture, the gospel still meets Wherever the culture is, it meets that and has and has the answer to whatever the problems and the situations are that we're facing. Oh yeah, I mean we just he and I just were in a meeting and one of our people that were on a mission trip in a different part of the world that's much more much more unchurched and and to hear, uh, you know, they would sit there for eight hours just turning the pages of the scripture and how and, it's, and this is in a culture that is as unlike what we are doing right now. Uh, you know, they're on a they're in a dirt floor. Uh, with no, you know, it's not like they're going to take their app out and, and and do it, but the gospel still speaks right into that culture. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 relevant to all cultures at all times and all peoples. Yeah. So follow up to that, we talked a little bit about challenges. What are some of the blessings um, that we see uh, as followers of Jesus as living in this current cultural moment here in the West? Eh, I'm not or sure. Potential I understand your or questions. potential <laughs> blessings. Uh, for example, oh. you know, just. There, there are definitely some pitfalls and some dangers and some struggles, but what are some of the good things um, in the midst of a very difficult time for many people? Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll make mention and Daniel uh, go. To me, it's, I know it's concerning because you have, you know, laws are changing. All the, There's a plenty of concerning thing. To me, two things stand out. If you really take all the statistics away, the percentage of practicing Christians in the U.S. has not changed. What has changed is cultural Christianity, because 20 years ago, whether you're a student or adult, it could be somewhat advantageous to show up. Even I've been here 15 years, so even 15 years ago at our church, uh, because we're a large church in a small town, it was probably somewhat advantageous, you know, if you're a businessman or a businesswoman, you know, I can show up, I can make connections, I can be seen, I'm doing the right stuff, I'm doing the church deal. Uh, that is no longer the case. Uh, if you know, there's, it's not that it costs a lot, but the, the distinction between a practicing Christian, n- people no longer think, you know, I, I need to go to church to be a good person, or I need to go to church for, to be respectful in society, so to speak. That part has changed. So I guess, and the good part is the, the, the purity of the gospel and mm-hmm. of Christianity mm-hmm. is a little easier to distinguish now than maybe before. It was almost like you go back to even like, some of the trouble that like Constantine had when in 300 and he kind of Christianizes everything. And all of a sudden that distinction of the gospel is blurred because it's almost institutionalized. Mm. Uh, And that's kind of what we've seen. And there's a lot of good things to that. But the bad part is that uh, sometimes it's easy to just be a cultural Christian versus an authentic Christian, Mm. uh, which is kind of how Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount to say, you know, there is a difference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think there has been a bit of a purifying, and 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 I think the church. A lot, a lot of people have said it. I think it's probably true. The the church exists best, and um, and steps into its vocation best when it is a, a minority, and it, mm-hmm. it understands that it's a, mon- a minority. So it mm-hmm. really can then be a light to the nations mm-hmm. um, when 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 culture isn't buying in fully to the values and, and it and it doesn't add economic or or relational benefit to be a Christian anymore, then then people have to ask, well, a, a, am I genuinely in because I love Jesus and I want to be a part of his church? And for if no sure. other gain is there, is that enough? And I think we've got that. Um I, I also think what what's cool about culture today is it millennials and Gen Z are genuinely open to having spiritual conversations. Mm. And uh, there's a there's a purity to it, kind of this post-Christian uh, culture that we find ourselves in here, here in Western North Carolina in a lot of pockets. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a purity to it when, when they don't come with a lot of church history. They come with just a genuine interest in, uh, in asking questions and finding answers to those yeah. questions. I, I think that's a cool thing going on right now. Yeah, no, no, 100%, 100%.
Yeah, I, I wanted to, you, you said a phrase there I want to kind of spend a minute on, which is that post-Christian culture. Uh, I, You know, you guys may disagree. I found it helpful to think about uh, kind of where we are. You can you can say there are, there are cultures, kind of like what you described earlier in Asia, where a mission trip happening, which is like a pre-Christian, the gospel hasn't really taken significant root in that area yet. You've got a Christian culture, which is that anomaly we've been describing, and then you have a post-Christian culture, uh, which is, I think, what we're saying we're either walking into or we're in right now. Um, so how would you define that space that we're in? Well, and, and for clarity, post-Christian does not mean the gospel is not still going out and God's right. not still saving right. people. It's more the cultural deal is about are the structures and the powers that be supportive, uh, or are they neutral or are they against? And to go to Daniel's point, even right now, statistically, you're talking about where the gospel flourishes. Um, the fastest, the places where the most people, now God's the one that saves, but you talk about where the churches are exploding, the fastest growing churches are not in the West right now. I mean, mm-hmm. they are in places where you have some degree, if not a large degree of opposition. And so, um, you know, whether you talk about, you know, the, the Chinas and the Middle East and some those yep. places are exploding with the gospel and they have none of the, uh, the power structure. Because bottom line, as Christians, we don't handle power very well. Mm-hmm. And so when we tend to get power, we tend to get... It, it can get corrupt, and it's you know you mix religion and politics. What do you end up with? You end up with politics. That's mm-hmm. that's the whole thing. And that, and there's some good things about that. And certainly, you know, you want to be salt and light and all of that. But there's also some dangers that have definitely been fulfilled, uh, in just in, in the time that we've been alive. Yeah. Anything to add there? With- yeah, maybe something that's just been said a few times, but when, when the dominant culture doesn't ascribe to or value the, 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 the Judeo-Christian mm-hmm. values that maybe four or five decades ago, the dominant culture would have agreed with the church. I, mm-hmm. I don't think that that's there today, mm-hmm. and I think that's right. at least an element of mm-hmm. post-Christendom. I, I read a... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, into, to what Daniel's talking about, Gen X and, and Gen Z, it also, when you don't have the... You know, when you have all the, the the accoutrements that help you, if you're a Christian, whether that be they, can, you know, somebody watching you is like, all right, you're getting benefit from that, yeah. because bottom line, the stuff that 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 the culture says, we know those are going to collapse. You know, the the yeah. stuff, the whether it be stuff or sex or status or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, Ecclesiastes talks about you know he has put eternity in the heart of man, and so there is a God is drawing, God is calling, and and when you have a culture like this, it's maybe a little easier for them to see the emptiness of all that stuff that's being promised because the world promises stuff that it can't deliver anyway. The gospel promises, you know, abundant life and eternal life, all that other stuff. Uh, but sometimes that gets blurred when you have all this benefit from being a Christian. And so another benefit of maybe a post-Christian culture is the clarity is like, yeah, this other right. stuff is not doing it. I can at least have the conversation. That's right. What is this gospel you're talking about? Who is this Jesus that you're talking about? What is his promise? And what is he, you know, what's been added that he's not promising stuff like that? So, yeah, yeah. I was thinking about, I mean, again, that's the stuff that Jesus would describe as a house built on sand, you know, that that's ever shifting. Uh, example that the Oscars are coming up, I think either this weekend or next week and sometime soon. And, you know, I'll usually take the time to to sit down and watch at least a, a section of those. I love movies. And uh, it's always interesting because you see like what you just described there as a millennial, I watch that and I see the hollowness of it. And they're like, oh man, this is what, this is the best that our culture has to offer, right. uh, which is interesting versus, you know, uh, the, the the stuff that was easier in the past, like Tim Keller would describe it as like moral furniture that mm. helps set people That's up right. for the gospel. So things yeah, like, um, you know, what, what the culture believes about sex or about marriage or, you know, all these different hot button issues previously were set up in a way that kind of made it a little bit easier at first um, to have those spiritual conversations. But that's changed um, quite a bit. And so, Daniel, one of the things I wanted to ask you, um, whether people realize it or not, you've done some ministry in a very postmodern context in London um, for the last few years. And so I'd love to hear some of your experience about living as a Christ follower and you know, uh, serving as a pastor in a context that, I don't know what you would say, I mean, is at least years ahead as far as where they're at culturally yeah. um, in relation to change. I, I think the first thing coming in as cultural outsiders into London a few years ago was uh, taking the posture of learners. Mm and not assuming that every European atheist thought the same way or every second-generation Muslim living in a European country thought the same way or even 
I mean, here, not assuming that every cowboy boot wearing bearded man who claims to be a Christian thinks and views things the same way. So actually having wow. conversations with people, having a long view in mind, um, and, and really earning the, the ability over time as you learn who they are, as you learn what they value, like we talked about earlier, the gospel has answers. The crucified and risen Jesus mm-hmm. has answers to what they desire. And it's just taking the time relationally and conversationally to uh, discern what those are and, and, and then see, see the gospel come to bear on their mm-hmm. lives and give answers. I, I think in that conversation as well, uh, entering into a, another culture is trying to discern what what is what are biblically mandated forms of of church and ministry, and then really trying to winnow out uh, what are just forms that I'm familiar with hmm. and what I've grown up with, and uh, and 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 we have the ability to be flexible on those things. Um, that that was something we were always and still are having conversations about. Yeah, that's great stuff. London's where I met D1 over here. That's anyway. right, man. That's yeah, awesome, first man. time. That's right. Had lunch. Uh, yeah. Did a little ministry over there. We got right. helping out with the church. Stopped into there. Lululemon. On the way down. We did, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. Went to All Souls Church. Uh, the, right. When oh, was yeah. it? Stotts Church? Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Such yeah. history, man. No. No, that's awesome. Um, I, I also wanted to kind of follow up for both of you on that, which is the context, the local context that we live in, being Asheville, the greater Asheville area, is also a very unique area. Um, it's not, you know, the city that London is, but it has some of the fingerprints of a very postmodern mm-hmm. area. And so, I mean, depending on which part of the city you're in, that's what I think is so fascinating that's is right. the difference in where we're sitting right now versus where you office and, and, and live out in the East, East Asheville. It contextually can be so different, just 20 miles away or however far. But um, what are some of the unique challenges and blessings um, that you guys have found about doing ministry in our area? Uh, where we live. Well, and for clarity, when we were at Lululemon in London, we were exegeting our culture, <laughs> right. is what we were doing. So we were this making sure yeah, we right. just doing ministry to Lulu. Um, so uh, gift cards can be to Lululemon. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, I mean, Asheville, we've been here, um, you know, decade and a half. Mm-hmm. And so uh, love it with all my heart, love the people. Um it is a mixture of worldviews that come together, a lot of streams that come together. And, uh, you know, we tried to, I know, especially the first few years, tried to discern those, understand those to more effectively uh, get the gospel. And we still do that. We're still, because it's still a changing culture. But again, a culture comes down to the people and the people are the mission field. And we want to make disciples and then send those disciples out into that culture. Mm. And, um, Again, I love the way Daniel mentioned. I, sh- I wish I didn't heard it. I would use it Sunday. Is between <laughs> syncretism and separatism, yeah. and and what you actually see is you see what Jesus did is engagement. You know, mm-hmm. he he neither yeah. he neither lowered the standard, and he didn't condone their sin. He actually dies for their sin, but he engages and he gets in there with people. And so that's what we've tried to do as a church, whether that be you know working with partners around the, the city. But I mean, Asheville is a it's a microcosm. Um, you know, it was probably, it had some of the same characteristics of when you look at a post-Christian culture it's in our in our country, it's kind of gone from the west, the coasts, and it's kind of squeezed in mm. uh, over the years. Yeah. And Asheville is a little ahead of that for a variety of reasons. And so, you know, it's not just a beautiful place to live. I mean, arguably the prettiest place in the country, yeah. but it's also a fascinating place to, to meet people. But any place you are, at some point, if you're going to do ministry, you have to love you have to love the people. You have to have a burden. I'm just, I still, like in the, in the book of Acts where Paul goes into Athens and it talks about his heart was burdened as he looked around and he saw, he saw all the temples to an unknown God and he was just, he, and, and he saw all that. And that's what I felt in several times uh, with Asheville. You know, you go down and you see all the beauty, but you also see what you were talking about with the Oscars or Grammys or whatever a few minutes ago. And there's been points in time where, you know, I'm not, well, I mean, like I remember one time probably the, this was, I don't, I think it's appropriate. You can edit it out if not. But <laughs> I, I remember probably that one of the heaviest feelings I've ever had was maybe 10 years ago. We were fairly new here, but, you know, we went downtown and, we, and the drum circle was big. Mm-hmm. And, you know, everybody's having, you know, it's fun to people watch and all that kind of stuff. But I just broken yeah, over that because yeah. uh, watching it, it was so trying to drum up happiness and drum up purpose and mm-hmm. drum up. And it just, I wasn't trying to ruin the people I was with, but I was broken just mm-hmm. watching that because to me it's like that's my city that God has called us to. Yeah. And that was before we were multi-site and more regional than than that. But I say that to say well, Asheville's awesome, but it is a 
you know, we're not racially diverse, just demographically, but it's very diverse in worldviews mm -hmm. from yeah. legalism to liberalism to all things in between. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think piggybacking the, the hard part about ministry here with, with that spectrum of uh, syncretism and, and separatism is there's comfort on both ends. There, there's a lot of comfort. Uh, it takes the tension off mm. to just fall right in mm -hmm. and be like everybody else. And it takes the tension off. There's a lot of comfort and just, nope, it's just me and my crew lo yep. locked in at the house yeah. and we're safe and, and we're good. And God doesn't call us to be comfortable, right? He, he mm -hmm. calls us as followers of Christ to be fruitful in that engagement that PB just talked about. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the hard part. And it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's finding the tension between uh, Romans 12 don't be conformed to the pattern of the world any longer. Um, but, but also the, the, what Paul said that he's become all things to all people. How can mm -hmm. both of those be true and how can we be both of those? And it takes wisdom, mm -hmm. right? It takes a daily reliance on the Holy spirit, which is hard. It doesn't take wisdom to just fall right in line with everybody else. It doesn't take wisdom just to remove myself from everything. That's why I love what you said back at Christmas, guys, if you get invited to a birthday party, no matter like, Use some wisdom, but just go to the birthday party, <laughs> yeah. right? Or the, the Christmas, Christmas, the Christmas party. Yeah. party. Christmas go to the Christmas party. party. There's going to be stuff going on that maybe you wouldn't do in other circumstances, but just be with the people. Yeah. And I think that's the hard part is the the, yeah. the wisdom line there yeah. to discern between the two. I had a really interesting uh, weekend experience because you preached, um, you know, uh, on Sunday about culture and how we relate to people and then looking at the life of Jesus and how he related to people. S the day before Saturday, I was... Uh, uh, working out in the front yard and some people were going door to door. Um, you know, and I, I couldn't quite tell what they were doing, but I could tell they were going door to door and just admittedly, mm. they pull into my driveway. I'm like, Oh man, here we go. You know? And I wasn't sure what to expect. The people came forward and, um, the guy had a Bible in his hand. Um, and they started talking and, and you know, I'm like stuck here. It, that's, that's my own admission. I'm like, Oh man, you know, I just, I wasn't ready for, for the conversation. And, uh, they were going around and uh, they were Christians, um, which surprised me. But what I was so struck by was how quickly the conversation we were having went into the world is wicked, God's going to destroy mm -hmm. it. And so yeah. which, you know, where are you at? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked for a while and I was reflecting later. I'm like, man, number one, like Jesus actually never came up in that conversation, which, mm -hmm. which just made me so sad um, for some of the way that, that churches and Christians have, have related to the culture at large. Um, and then the second thing is just I would hear, then hearing you on Sunday and looking at the life of Jesus and how he related to this specific woman, it was like there is such a difference in how often we relate to our world versus how Jesus did. Um, and finding that balance is so interesting. Um, but I wanted to ask kind of just from what you guys have seen, what are some of the uh, – some of the ways, maybe some of the, the good and the bad that churches or, or Christians have historically tried to meet culture. I know we've, we've kind of talked about this a little bit, um, but what, what are some of the pitfalls maybe is a good place to start? Well, I mean, I think the part, you know, that we all have to struggle with, or we all have to deal with is especially the longer you're saved, you forget what it's like to be lost. Mm -hmm. And I think it's Luther that said that we are bent toward works-based righteousness and that is our gravitational pull. If we don't continually saturate ourselves with the gospel and grace, we tend to become like the... I mean, wow. we, we, we're, we take the Bible real seriously here. And, and because we do, we need to recognize that what we saw in Luke 7 with the Pharisee, that is... that It's not us per se, but that easily... We drift that way mm -hmm. if we're not continually going back to you know, that confidence and humility. We're confident because we're in a great situation because of what Jesus did, but we're humble because, you know what, not only but for the grace of God go I, but that's God's grace that saved me. And so um, I think the broken, and, and uh, I can't remember, I think Daniel grew up with a great church and stuff, and so he has a, he had a great foundation. Me not growing up in church, it's a little bit easier. I can still, even though I'm, you know, decades removed from it, I can still remember what it's like to be lost. Mm -hmm. I can still remember yeah. what it's like to go. I was talking, I didn't include this in the sermon. I should have, I was talking to Lori afterwards and I was like, I should have included, you know, going into a good church. I mean, I went into, you know, if I had a girlfriend or something like that, I'd go to church with her or something like that. And I still, and it was a fairly small town. And as an athlete, you kind of, in a small town as an athlete, you kind of are known, mm -hmm. but I was also wild as a hoot owl. So <laughs> when I would walk in, when I would walk into that church, I still, even now remember 
And again, I'm not trying to use an excuse. I do remember the chat mm. chatter of, uh, you know, and it wasn't positive chatter. And I remember even some, you know, parents like, if he's going to act like that, my kid's not hanging around him. Mm. And that, that whole tension of, and again, I know those are parenting decisions and you want to have a peer group. I know all that stuff. I'm just saying as a lost kid, I could feel the eyeballs. Mm. And they, they weren't eyeballs of engagement. They were eyeballs of separate, of separatists. It's like, mm. we are going to remove ourselves because that stuff will get on us. Mm. And that stuff's going to get on my... And I, I mean, again, uh, God saved me a few years later, but that part is is very real. And if you take... And this was a church that took the Bible real seriously too. That is a gravitational pull. Wow. I think you have to continually remind yourself, you know, the grace of God moral purity, all those things are true. And yet at the same time, and if you're with people, I mean, I, people, just talking with people. I love talking to lost people because my dad was lost and we grew up that way. And so I know, I mean, that, those are easy for me to relate to. And it keeps you kind of grounded. It's like, and, and you see God at work. And yeah. the part where you get the most separate is if you're never sharing the gospel. Yeah. That's really what it is. Yeah. If you are wow. never engaging a lost person, you eventually are going to end in the ivory tower. Mm. And you turn in and churches. If the churches are doing that, that's how. I mean, you got oh, seven thousand yeah. churches a year dying mm. in the West. And that was before COVID. And some of the reason, a lot of the reason, is at some point it got turned inward about our programs and our processes. And it happens without unless you try to go against it. It happens naturally. Wow. And pastors are the same way. We talk about it at the starting point. Pastors, we, I mean, we love preaching the sermons and we love the people. Most of God's people are, are good. 90% of them are awesome. 10% are crazy. But <laughs> um, but but you like them. They, you know, but the hard part is how do you engage a lost city? Because I promise any pastor is listening right now, God's put you there not just to make it a great place for your people. That's awesome. But there's some people who are not yet in your church. And you talked about the door to door, and I've done door to door, and and it can be effective. And you want to right. mention, you do want to mention Jesus. That's always yeah, that, a good that's thing. That's helpful. <laughs> yeah, it's helpful to mention Jesus. Um, yeah. But I would say, secondly, to people say it's the only way. I mean, just think about who you're around yeah. every day. I mean, you're around people every day. So instead of saying I got to go up to a stranger who doesn't know you, what about the person in the cubicle yeah. next to you? Yeah. What about the person in the little league team? What about the person who's in your neighborhood? What about the person in your family? It's not that. Cold turkey's not, it's not wrong. Right. Uh, preaching down a drum circle, it's not wrong. But man, why don't you start off with somebody who actually knows your material? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's harder though, right there. Mm. It is harder, but I think you then ask the question, why? That's right. Wow. You know, I was thinking about uh, you just saying that one of the blessings of serving on our missions team for a while was seeing how God was taking things from the greater culture and using those things to, to kind of push the gospel forward. Mm. So for example... Um, like statistically, this is very prominent in, in Hindu cultures. God's using um, prayer, people like praying, missionaries praying over people and healing people in order to open a door for the gospel. In Muslim context, God very frequently uses things like visions mm -hmm. to start gospel conversations that connect to Christ followers because that's a big thing in that culture. <laughs> and so I'm hearing that going, that's the macro but on the micro level, mm -hmm. what's God already doing in your cubicle yeah, where right. you can meet and start those conversations? Yeah, and, I th and, and, and on a pragmatic basis, I can't remember the third one, but it was basically, um, you know, when it comes to cultural stuff, you know, some stuff you do reject from mm -hmm. the culture. You can't reconcile that, whether it be, you know, it might be sexuality, something like that. It's just you, those are irreconcilable. Right. But some things you redeem. And that is where Christians tend to get bent out of shape about it. Mm -hmm. um, just a quick, the quick example, like, like that video, um, the little sermon clip we did uh, on "Wait in the Truck." Yeah, "Wait in the Truck" was is a country song that was cult, you know, culturally that it was used as an illustration, but it's, and it ended up going crazy. I think there's whatever nine million views, yeah. and I've looked at the, most of the comments, and I will say. Um, uh, the TikTok people are a little nicer. The Instagram people are pretty nice. The Facebook people are crazy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because it's basically saying, you're telling somebody they ought to kill somebody. I'm like, no, 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 no. No, it's not. That. Look, listen to it. It's mm. taking a, you know, the fact that there is a just God and we have a sense of wanting justice and the song is popular partly because in a sense, justice was done versus, and, I'm saying, and I didn't say justice was done. I didn't say, you know, they're quoting me, you know. Don't take vengeance, you know, Hebrew, Romans chapter 12. I was like, I understand that. Yeah, yeah. But my point is, how do you how do you take culture and redeem it in a sense? Because there is a just God. 
Mm-hmm. And there is a sense of justice in the Imago Dei that he's put in you. Yeah. And there's the tension. Obviously, for us, we see that reconciled in Christ. I mean, he's the one that was, he was crucified for us. So God took his justice and the wrath and and poured it out on him. Um, so anyway, I just, I was, yeah. I came to mind because it is, people get bent out of shape and it goes back to syncretism versus separatism. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need to come up with a middle one that starts with an S. I'm yeah, not sure then, what it is. Then we've nailed it. We've nailed it. It's like, we'll put a, <laughs> we'll make a book together. But that is synch- <laughs> syncretism is, you know, just everything pushed together. Yeah. Separatist is let's withdraw from the culture, but the engagement, which doesn't start with an S, we got to, that's, yeah. that's the podcast people. That is what we please, have to, please, please, submit, please, you're submit, your, yeah. please submit your S for, um, <laughs> for what is the proper term of yeah. engagement. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, going off of those two big application points in the beginning and also there at the end of your message, which is, hey, as followers of Jesus, we're going to hold to our convictions and we're going to grow in our compassion. Or at least that, that's what our goal should be, is both of those things. So I wanted to kind of um, start to wrap up by asking um, for, for people who are listening and watching what some recommendations would be for people to do both of those things. And maybe we can take them one at a time, um, start with hold to our convictions and then grow our compassion. Um, just practical ideas. I mean, hold, holding to our convictions, I, I think it's all, all your biblical disciplines, the, um, you know, the, the, the reading of scripture, the, the, the time with, with brothers and sisters to, to grow and understanding what did God say? What did he not say? How, how, how do I work it out in, in, into my life and in, into my word, uh, how I speak? It's, it's the church, right? It's being a, being a, being a part uh, a meaningful part of, mm. of of the church family, and and I think that's where our practice mm. really gets shaped. Yeah, um, and to piggyback on that, when it comes to convictions, I would also help us to say, make sure you can distinguish between a biblical conviction and yeah. a personal preference. Because a lot of Christians they go beyond what is clear in the Bible, and they go to their personal preferences, whether that be dress or whatever. And wow. if all you got to just if you if you go on Twitter, I mean, all of Christian Twitter, ninety percent of it is not on biblical conviction. It's on it's on personal preferences, mm-hmm. things that are not crystal clear. And the Bible talks about don't don't judge don't judge another guy. That guy's going to do that in those what uh, called disputable areas that Romans calls it gray areas or disputable areas or matters of matters of dispute. So, but certainly. You, you, you know, unapologetically, if the Bible's clear, you'd be clear. If the Bible's dogmatic, be dogmatic about it. And then the other one, just compassion is a hard issue. It really is. And yeah. it, it is the idea of understanding your own sin, understanding, you know, and being with people. I mean, people are, I mean, it's, people are amazing, honestly. I mean, yeah, we're wrecked by sin, but you get in people, everybody's got a story. Mm. I mean, that's the part, you go down to Asheville or wherever. I mean, I think it's, I think if you can remember, everybody's made in the image of God. Yeah. Everybody is a potential recipient of the grace of God in, in Jesus and what he did on the cross. And then number three is everybody has a story. Mm. I mean, they have a background. And it doesn't condone, Jesus didn't condone what she did because of her past, but he obviously knew it. And so I guess those three things have been super helpful. You know, again, everybody I'm going to see today has been made in the image of God. They've yeah. been made, they have intrinsic worth because they've been made by God who loves them. They're not just an amalgamation of cells that was an accident. They have been made and created by God. Number two, they are a potential recipient of the grace of God. I mean, yeah. Jesus, Jesus' death can totally transform them. And then just three, just realizing people have a story. They have stuff and it's probably not our story. Um, it's Daniel's story. You know, Daniel got some blessings that other people didn't get. I got some blessings that other yeah. people didn't get. And just realize they have a story. Um, and you don't know the story until you maybe just care. Yeah. Ask. Listen. Yeah, thoughts on growing in compassion. Yeah, I, had a, I was at a conference last week on how to how the church engages with the LGBTQ plus community. And the guy's line, he flipped the little line that we use in kind of our circle of evangelicalism, love the sinner, hate the sin, or that we've at least heard. And he said, how about this? Love the sinner, hate your own sin, and both of you trust Jesus to, <laughs> to grow you mm. into his likeness. And, you know, I, I, I think it, it's another way of saying we, we've got to, you know, preach the gospel to ourselves daily, yeah. um, daily be uh, those who rely on grace. You know, when, when we have the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with other people, unlike those folks that, that came to your door, I think if we approach it, I've got the answers. Let me have this one-way dissemination of information. And, sh- and we do need to be bold. We do have right. the right. answers. But I think uh, what I've tried to grow in in humility is, this is an opportunity not only for the person across the table from me to hear uh, uh, 
you know, where, where hope can be found mm-hmm. in Jesus. It's also an opportunity as I share to grow in my own understanding of who Jesus is, the questions that he has answers for, for me to rely on the spirit in this conversation for actually for two people wow. to grow towards mm-hmm. Jesus in a conversation. Yeah, that's yeah. good. And I, I will say this is lastly, this it, it's helpful. I think for us to remember, there's nothing new under the sun in our response to culture. Mm. If you look back and we did this and not to to repeat everything, but the way that the Jewish people were struggling with their culture and their culture was a pagan Roman group that had come in and all the stuff um, and the way they kind of had their things they did are very much what's today, you know, from mm-hmm. syncretism, which was more the Sadducees to uh, the, the separatism, which was more the Pharisees to the people kind of going crazy, crazy, which are more the zealots, you know, to the Essenes who were like, let's, you know, be preppers and let's, you know, go up on the mountains and yeah. not come back. And so Jesus comes into all of that culture and he shows us how to do it. And that's why that's top five passage for me. I love that passage in Luke seven, because there's so many dynamics, both warnings and encouragements. I mean, I could be in that passage. I could preach that passage every week. Yeah. That's the thing I was going to say is that I find that my compassion for people grows as my intimacy with Jesus grows. Because I'm so struck by like, you know, going through the gospel of John last year, we've talked about how. When you actually like are looking at and you're thinking about no, this is this these things really happen and seeing the way Jesus interacted with sinful and broken people over and over so consistently, he approached people in the same way with the same compassion and truth. And um, as I am conformed into his image, then I start to to grow naturally um, in compassion for other people. But that takes so much work, and it's the process that we've been talking about quite a bit. Um, so let me let me ask this just to wrap up. Uh, for, for folks who are really maybe wrestling with some of these some of these ideas we've been talking about, any recommended resources that you would say, um, whether big or small, to to check out to to kind of take that next step? Well, um, golly, um, I mean Tony Evans got a bunch of stuff out. Um, he's got an older book. It's Kingdom Agenda, which mm-hmm. was kind of some of the genesis of the series in general. Uh, Platt's got a book called Counterculture. Everybody's got a book on culture. You know, go back. D- it was a D.A. Carson's Christ and Culture. Yeah, that's way, way back. Um, the Tale of Two Kingdoms. Just kidding. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a sermon series. Yeah. No, and because what some of it's so specific, mm. like gender. You know, that's like a that's specific. Um, you know, Rebecca McLaughlin's got a little book called The Secular Creed, okay. which is maybe 40 pages, maybe 50, 60 pages, something like that. Mm-hmm. And if you're like, all right, I got, um, I don't want to read some big treaties. Uh, she's got that's some X cause it takes basically some of the sign, you know, the, like a sign you see in a yard that has all these things and looks at it from, uh, you know, a biblical perspective and also an engagement perspective. So, you know, McLaughlin's a thing is called The Secular Creed. Again, 50, 60 pages. That'd be you know, if you want a little primer, that'd be one Absolutely. I think would be helpful. Anything by Tim Keller. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Of course, yeah. Lo- love it. Yeah. Um, he's yeah. got some more academic and more, uh, you know, accessible stuff. There's a guy named Dan Strange who we rub shoulders with in, in England, and he wrote a book called Plugged In. And the bottom line is the gospel uh, confronts and connects with any worldview out wow. there hmm. from the cultural Christian who grew up in church. And because his grandma was a Christian and because he goes to church sometimes, he he thinks he's in. The gospel confronts that like, no, nah, man, that isn't it. But the gospel also connects with it and says there actually is a way mm-hmm. that you can you, you you can actually connect with Jesus. To, to Islam, to Hinduism, the gospel, you know, cut, knocks the knees out of every worldview, mm-hmm. but it also says those desires are right and Jesus is is the way forward. So plugged in by That's Dan great. Strange was mm. huge for me. That's awesome. Again the, again, the main source though is just staying in the word. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, it's, great books are out there, but the way that you can both hold your conviction and have compassion is is the word because the word ends up continually churning up your heart. Mm. And that's that's where it all starts. Yeah. That's fantastic stuff. Thank you guys both so much. Uh I would love to just keep doing this for the next three hours and keep having this conversation but this is a good it's place fun. to good place to stop uh, i think this is going to be encouraging for a lot of people and uh just a reminder before we wrap up this is a conversation that we're kind of getting out to you but we'd love to hear from you as well so feel free any questions any thoughts email us at podcast at builtmorechurch.com we'd love to discuss some of those along the way uh, as we continue having these discussions this year of worship has already been off to a great start we're seeing god do some amazing things And again, this podcast is part of that. We want you to grow in your relationship with Jesus, and hopefully this is going to help you do that week by week. Uh, Daniel, 
we kind of we, we end things like we end Sundays. So any chance you can send the people out, hopefully you know the phrase I'm looking for here. Let's see. Great time together. Loved and sent. <laughs>